My name is Tom Cole. I'm one of the judges here in the Chatham County Juvenile Court. We hear all sorts of cases that affect children and families. Most of our work is regarding delinquency matters, which are things that would be crimes if they were adults, or dependency. Uh, and dependency deals with neglect and abuse of children. Kids come into foster care for all sorts of reasons. Um, unfortunately, the majority of kids do seem to come in for what's called neglect more than abuse. Um, neglect can be anything from poverty-related issues to substance abuse-related issues to mental health issues in the parents. We have resources, we have partners in the community that aid those parents to become effective, nurturing caregivers. And right now, there is a, a large, gaping, hole in our services, and that is local foster homes. Generally, Chatham County ranges between three and 500 children in foster care. Very few of those children are able to be housed and kept in foster care in Chatham County. The problem with having children placed out of county is that they're not only placed far away from their families, they're not only far away from the courts, they're not just ripped out of their schools and all of the other familiar things they know. Um, but it means that their legal advocate team all have to travel, you know, 45 minutes, an hour, sometimes five hours, just one way to go see them, which makes it much harder for us to advocate for these kids. If those children are placed on the other side of Atlanta, the parent's not going to visit with them. If we can keep a child in our community, you know, with neighbors and friends and relatives that are there that can support them, then the trauma on that child is going to be less. The family is going to be able to visit with the child, and it's going to be easier for that parent to work towards reunification. Fostering compassion is definitely a key to being able to help these kids and these families. Um, it's not just being a foster parent, it's being part of a care team, it's providing meals, it's providing respite. There are a lot of foster parents who are essentially given a child, told when and where to take them to doctor's appointments, and there's not a lot of support or any backup for them if stuff comes up. What I saw a couple years ago was the church had actually gathered a group and circled them around this foster parent so that if they needed some casserole dishes, if they needed somebody to, to watch the kids while they went on date night, and whatever it was, this group was there to help support and make the mission that foster parent was on more successful and more achievable. To see fostering compassion step forward and help meet part of that need is an amazing thing. Jesus called us to take care of the little children. He asked the little children to come to him and we are supposed to be the hands and feet of God. We have an obligation as neighbors, as a community, to provide a safe place for them, to provide a nurturing and loving place for them while we rebuild that family and make it safe for them to go home. Foster children, volunteer for foster organizations, help out with PAC be a CASA, do anything you can to support children in our community. Hey, let's thank the Lord for that great ministry, right? Wow. I'm telling you, fostering compassion makes a difference. And man, I'm so excited. I talk to people all the time who've started fostering kids or in the process of adopting a child who are part of our church heard about this opportunity to make a difference here at Compassion. My own family has gotten involved in this, and I just am so thankful for the difference we're able to make. Uh, I hope you will pray for all of our families that are fostering a child or adopting a child. There are three ways that you can help make a difference here at Compassion. One is, if you want to be a foster parent, let us know. We can help direct you on that. If you'd like to help with an adoption, we can help with adoption as well. If you want to be on one of those support teams, you know, that does everything from phone calls to pizza, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we pray sometimes, we bring pizza over sometime, just so, so these folks know they're not in this fight alone. Uh, and let me tell you, it is a fight sometime. Uh, but man, if you want to be a part of that as well, just go to Connecting Point on any one of our campuses after this service. Uh, they will give you all the information, all the help you need to make a decision about that. Uh, and man, I just, our goal is to get every foster kid in our region into a compassion Christian home. Can I hear an amen? Come on, man. We get these kids into Christian homes, some of these horror stories will stop 
and we'll praise the Lord for that. Okay, let's, uh, let's start. We're starting our next, uh, our last lap or two uh, in a study all the way through the book of Acts. I have loved this. Uh, I hope the spirit of these New Testament believers that took the gospel around the world has now uh, made a difference in your spirit. Uh, and I hope we're going to see here at Compassion, you know, some of the things that we've learned as we've studied this great book and see it applied in our lives and in our ministry together. Now, open your Bible with me to Acts 27. If you've got your Bible, open it up. Uh, if you've got one of these analog versions, grab it. If it's on your phone, dial it up. Uh, get it ready to go. Uh, Acts 27, verse 1 is where we're going to start. Uh, Ray Stedman, great preacher from a generation ago, when he wrote his chapter on Acts 27, he called it God and Shipwrecks. And I think that's a great title because I pretty much can guarantee you're going to face some shipwrecks in your life. Amen? Amen? For example, have you ever been in a situation where you thought you might actually die? Now think about that. I thought about it this past week, and I think that's happened to me twice. Uh, once when I was a kid, but I was a minor. It was my fault, but I don't have to talk about it because I was underage and it's none of your business. All right. <laughs> Let's just say I proved I am not Aquaman. I proved that. All right. The last time I thought I was going to die, I was in college. Uh, I was playing on the Point University basketball team. We were traveling to get fitted for basketball shoes. The guy I was riding with got distracted, swerved off the road, slammed us into this huge telephone pole. I mean, it came in on me just like this. Uh, I was sitting in the front passenger seat. I was not wearing a seatbelt. Everybody say Dumbo. Dumbo. You should not talk about your pastor like that. But anyway, let's just say that. If I had been wearing a seatbelt, it would have saved me a lot of pain and a lot of problems. We went from 35 miles an hour forward to two miles an hour backwards in like a second. And a lot happened in that second. Uh, first thing we hit was a mailbox. Post came up through the bottom of the car, between my feet, broke both of my ankles. Uh, my, when my face hit the dash, it crushed my nose, shattered my cheekbones, broke my top row of teeth off, uh, ran that backwards and split the roof of my mouth. Uh, my top lip was ripped from the nose down and I ruined my favorite football jersey. I had actually been swinging a golf club uh, before I got in the car and I was holding that club between my feet and, and when, my, my, when I went forward and hit the dash, that club jammed into my chest, which would have killed anybody else. But it broke into multiple pieces, both of them stabbed into my right leg. But in the process, man, when I got jammed up on that golf club, it just knocked the breath out of me. And so when I, you know, we finally stopped and I looked up, man, I mean, blood is pouring from my forehead and my nose and my mouth and and I couldn't breathe. And so I looked over at the driver, and he looked at me and went pale and yelled and jumped out of the car, which was not very comforting. <laughs> and then I actually remember sitting back thinking, Lord, is this it? I mean, is this how I'm going to die? And when I mentally turned to the Lord, I'm, I kid you not, a peace just came over me. And then by God's grace, I caught my breath. I saw another buddy from the basketball team running over, you know, to help me out of the car. Uh, he got me out on the ground. We waited for the ambulance. And then after lots of plastic surgery, did I mention I used to look exactly like Brad Pitt? <laughs> what are you laughing at? What? Oh, man, that hurts my feeling. I only got one and you heard it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Listen, when I got all healed up months later, I remember one of my professors, I lost 35 pounds in 10 days. I mean, I was in perfect physical condition. And man, when I stopped eating because of all those facial injuries, the weight just fell off of me, man. But I looked, like, I looked like a zombie. And I'm telling you, one of my professors walked up to me and said, Cam, do not miss what God is going to try to teach you through all of this. This is going to be one of the greatest learning, growing opportunities of your life. And you know, that old man was right. I mean, what looked like a disaster to me became one of the most amazing learning growing, one of the greatest ministry opportunities of my life. I kid you not, my Bible college buddies would come up to see me at South Fulton Hospital, and my mouth was wired shut. I couldn't say a word, but they'd just turn over and start witnessing to my roommates in the hospital room, and I'm telling you, God used that in amazing ways. Wish I had time to tell you about it. But I wonder if you've ever, ever had a terrifying experience like that where you thought you might die. I mean, I'm sure many of you have. Uh, maybe you had a stroke or a heart attack or in a car wreck like I was, uh, maybe you got injured in the war, uh, maybe you got assaulted somehow. Uh, I got a couple of friends who are fighting the good fight against cancer right now or some other illness, maybe that's you. And let me tell you, if you've been there or you're there right now, you should really resonate with what happens to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27. Now listen, anytime we face a challenging situation, we can choose to just go through that situation 
or we can choose to grow through that situation. And if we choose wisely, we will grow spiritually and God will be glorified and good things will happen. So buckle up. Uh, we're going to go all the way to Acts 27. You know, in 1 Timothy 4, Paul told Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a big bite. You all ready? So sit up straight, pay attention. I'm praying that you will learn today what you need to learn to grow through whatever shipwreck is on the horizon for you. Now, there are, now notice I didn't say if there's a shipwreck. There is one. And I'm just hoping we'll get you tooled up and ready for it. There are five movements in this chapter, and it begins with Paul's departure. Look at verse one. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy. Now, you remember, Paul was in jail in Caesarea in Israel. He appealed to Caesar because those jokers were just jerking him around. And so off to Italy, he goes to stand trial in uh, Rome before Caesar. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some of the other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. That's, that's a big deal. We boarded the ship from Adam. Adramidium, uh, and are about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, uh, and we put out to sea, and Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us, all right? The next day we landed in Sidon. Uh, Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs, all right? Now, that's the, that's the launch. Let's take a minute, and let's look at the people who are mentioned in these verses, because these are the players that God's going to be working in and working through. Paul, main character, He's been the main character of the last few chapters of the book of Acts. We know him well. Uh, he is in the custody of a centurion named Julius, a Roman centurion who we have not previously met, but who appears to be a really compassionate Roman centurion. Read your Bible. You will not find Jesus say one negative thing about a Roman centurion. These are not all saved men, but they are pretty solid guys. And let me tell you, he's got all the authority on this ship but he is going to treat Paul with courtesy and respect all throughout this voyage. In verse 3, it says, Julius allows Paul's friends to come and care for him in Sidon. Many scholars think it's because he was still sick from his last missionary journey, and those friends came to give him medical care and supplies and all that, and thank the Lord. He was a part of the Imperial Regiment of the Roman Army, which meant it was a, that was an elite unit that reported only to the emperor. And so on that boat, dude, Julian's the man. He is the man. Well, that's what everybody thinks in the beginning. Uh, notice verse 2 starts with we. Uh, this is one of the famous we passages where the author of this book, Luke, is traveling with Paul, and when he's with him, he says we, all right? Uh, also, uh, you know, look where it says another guy mentioned is Aristarchus, who was a young buck that Paul had met in Thessalonica and led to Christ on his second missionary journey. Uh, listen, Aristarchus volunteers to travel with Paul just to help him. Dude, whatever it is, anything, anytime, anywhere, I'm your guy. Friends, think about the love that he had to have for the apostle Paul that was strong. Many scholars think he had to sign on that boat as Paul's slave just to get on the boat. But he did because he wanted to serve in that capacity. Which brings us to the second movement in this story, and that is the impatient disregard for danger. If anybody here has ever done that, airline pilots, just say, mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about here? We get a little impatient and <laughs> you do something that you wouldn't have done if you weren't so impatient or if you're under a little bit less stress. Do you about the kid whose dad came home with a briefcase full, full of work every night and his boy's just watching his daddy, brings his briefcase home every night, work, 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 every night. Finally says, Dad, why do you bring your briefcase home and work every night? And he says, well, son, it's because I can't get all my work done at the office. And then his son says, well, Dad, couldn't they put you in a slower group? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Let me tell you, Julius is going to wish he put himself in a slower group before this story is over. But anyway, uh, here's what's going to happen. Uh, their job is to take Paul from Caesarea to Rome, okay? Uh, and what they're doing is they got on this little beater, this little coastal, you know, barge, and they're working their way up to Tarsus and around this way to my... And the reason they're doing this is because it's late in the, it's late in the season and the winds are coming up and they're trying to stay under the cover of land because they should not be on the water. All right, look at verse 9. Much time had been lost. Sailing had already become dangerous. Everybody say dangerous. Because by now it was after the fast. Now, the fast is a reference to Yom Kippur, which is a Jewish holiday that was called the Day of Atonement, which is in October every year. And the rule was after 
the Day of Atonement, you don't sail. You don't sail in the Mediterranean Sea. Those big northeast winds start blowing hard and things get crazy on the water. But here's what they thought was going to happen. They thought we're going to get on this boat and we're just going to scoot over here right north of Sicily, which was called Syracuse back in the day, go right on the toe of Italy, bam, up to Rome, job done. That ain't what happened, okay? They shouldn't be on this water. What they actually do is beat their way uh, around to here and they are really struggling. When they got to Myra, the centurion commandeers this big Egyptian grain ship, you know, they're sailing for Rome, and now they're thinking, okay, here's what'll happen. Now we got us a big boat. We're gonna go straight across, boom, boom, boom. Everything's gonna be fine. Didn't work out that way. As Soon as they got their ship on the water, the wind hit them, blew them off. I mean, just blew them off course. They end up on the lee side of Crete, you know, on the, uh, 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 hide behind the wind a little bit. They stop at Fairhaven, which is a little dopey, do nothing town. And they wish they were in Phoenix, which is like Savannah, which is a cool port city. Can I hear an amen? All right. But this is where they are in Fairhaven. And they got some decisions to make. Anybody got any music from The Clash? Cue it up. Should I stay or should I go? Right? That's the question. Should I stay or should I go? Now, in Proverbs 27, it says, the prudent see danger and they take refuge. But the simple-minded, they just keep on going and they paid the penalty. Now, Paul's getting ready to make a speech here, and, and this is not divine revelation. Dude, this is just common sense. Guys, it's fall. The, the winter winds are starting to blow. It does this every year. It ain't gonna get better, it's gonna get worse. Man, sailing is over. But you know, common sense wasn't that common uh, on this boat. Look at, look at verse uh, nine. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous. It's going to bring great loss to ship and cargo and our own lives as well. But the centurion, instead of listening to that stupid preacher, he followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship who are financially motivated. And in verse 12, since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, which basically means Fair Havens is this little do-nothing town, ain't no bars and clubs there like we like. And so the majority decided that we will sail on hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. And you know, if we can't get to Rome, let's at least try to stay in a city where we can party a little bit. So off they go, and that brings them to the third movement, which is a devastating storm. Now, as we've read through Acts, has it ever wondered to you why there's so much information about their travel trials in the book of Acts? Uh, you know, I don't know how much you know, international travel you've done in your life, but for me, Every time I go offshore, flights get canceled, plans change, some crazy thing happens, and then it becomes a story I can tell for the rest of my life. No kidding. I was flying home from Texas a week or two ago, and I was sitting by this Gulfstream pilot. Uh, this guy lives in San Francisco. He's on, on his way over to flight safety to take some classes. I kid you not, we talk nonstop from Atlanta to Savannah about that crazy stuff that has happened to us traveling internationally. But that's not what the Holy Spirit is doing here in Acts 27. What he's gonna have shared is a story about how a bunch of dumbos made a bad decision, got a bunch of holy people in danger, and then God shows up because of prayer and does some incredible thing to get them all out of trouble. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Lord. That's what this story is about. Look at verse 13. A gentle south wind began to blow, and then they... Who is they? Well, that's the centurion and the captain and the sailors who want to get out of this little dog town. They thought they had obtained what they wanted, and so they weighed anchor, and they sailed along the shore of Crete. Man, these guys see five minutes of clear skies and gentle winds, and they ignore all the weather predictions. That stupid preacher, he don't know what he's talking about. Let's hit it. Rookie mistake. Look at verse 14. Before very long, a hurricane force. Anybody here ever heard of a hurricane before? Ever been in one of those? When I say hurricane, you should say, boo. So let's try this again. Before long, a wind of hurricane force. (laughs) That's southern people right there. We know what that is, right? Called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm, could not head into the wind. So we just gave way and were just driven along. As, you know, 
As we passed the lee of a small island called Cauda, uh, we were hardly able to even make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, which are like 150 miles off the north shore of North Africa, and it's just a ship's graveyard out there. And so they lowered the sea anchor, just trying to slow the ship down and let the wind just blow it along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they started throwing the cargo overboard. So there goes all the money. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. There goes more money. And when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, this is before radar, sonar, compasses, Loran, GPS. If you can't see the sun and the stars, you can't steer. And after they had gone for days without seeing any of it, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Think of the depression on that boat. Hopeless, helpless, hurt. Anybody here ever been seasick before? That hurts, amen. You ever been on a boat in rough water before, getting banged all over the place? Hurt, despairing, driven before the hurricane, gave up all hope. And then comes the fourth movement in this chapter because help is on the way because God is going to send the Coast Guard. No, he's sending a spiritual leader. He's sending a spiritual leader. Friends, we've said this a thousand times here at Compassion during the COVID pandemic and hurricanes and tornado disasters and recessions in the past and recessions that are on the horizon. Followers of Jesus do the best of things in the worst of times. Amen? Amen. Let's say it all together like lions. Come on. Followers of Jesus do the best of things in the worst of times. Now, we don't always get it perfect. But I'm telling you, one of the reasons that the gospel swept across the Roman Empire in the book of Acts and why it continues to sweep across continents today is because when life gets tough, spiritual leaders step up. Followers of Jesus step up. Look at what Paul does next. Look at verse 21. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, (laughs) you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete, and then you would have spared yourself all this damage and loss. And like I say, we don't always get it right. Sometimes the desire to say, I told you so, just takes us over, right? And it, or maybe, maybe Paul's trying to save their life. Maybe what he's concerned is for the value of their life. He says, look, man, when we were in Crete, I was sharing with you what the Lord Jesus, who can see the future, was sharing with me. And now it's crystal clear what happens when you ignore the Lord. Listen. I'm nobody special, but Jesus is, and you should pay attention when he starts talking. You should pay attention to him when you start getting married, and you think about cheating on your spouse, and you think about sexual purity because you're single, or gender, or generosity, or business ethics, or who you're going to vote for in about 10 days. You need to be paying attention to what Jesus says, because if you do not damage and loss is on the horizon for everybody. Friends, Paul's saying, look, let me give you a little spiritual leadership and a little encouragement here in the darkest moment when everybody else has given up. In verse 22, I urge you. Now, in the Greek, uh, this word urge is the strongest possible encouragement. I urge you to keep up your courage, man. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Well, how does he know that? I'll tell you. Last night, an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me, and that angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You're going to stand trial before Caesar. Don't worry about anything, bro. You are going to Italy. That's God's will going to be done. And God has graciously given you the lives of all those who work with you and sail with you. What, what's he talking about? Man, Paul's been praying to God to spare the lives of the people on this boat. Who's on that boat? The Romans who put him in handcuffs, right? His enemies, his captors, 200 strangers, his friends, Luke and Aristarchus. Paul had been praying for all those guys. And you know what? God said, I'm going to take care of them if, everybody say if, yeah. if they do what I tell you for them to do. If they do what the Lord says, then I'll spare every single one of their lives. So Paul says, keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as I have been told. Nevertheless, We must run aground on some island because you ignored God's warning. 
And you know, sometimes when, when hard things happen, the temptation is to think, God don't love nobody. God doesn't care about me. If God was really good, he wouldn't let me suffer like this, which is emotionally honest and totally inaccurate. Inaccurate. Friends, sometimes we suffer because we've made a bad decision just like the owner of this ship. We ignore God. We ignore God's word because we think we're smarter than God or we just want what we want. And that bad decision brings us suffering. And if you've ever done that, just go, mm-hmm. And all the liars will get to you next week because <laughs> we've all done this, right? Sometimes we suffer because other people make bad decisions and their foolishness splashes all over us. Like the 270 people on that ship who are suffering because they got on a boat you know, with a leader who ignores God's word. And if you ever got hurt that way, let's just go, mm-hmm. Sometimes we suffer because we live in a broken world. We live in a world that sin broke. This is not God's intention for this world. This is what sin produces. And so we find ourselves really often in the path of a hurricane of miscarriages and heart disease and addiction and cancer. And it's nobody's fault necessarily. I, I mean, it's the result of living in a broken world. And you know, God has promised to fix all of this eventually, but not yet. And if you've ever been hurt just because our world is broke, just say, mm-hmm. Now, now let's, look at this, let's look at this map one more time. The idea was they're going to sail, they wanted to sail from Fairhaven to Phoenix, right? What actually happens is they just get blown off course. They get blown all the way down here, literally, they think they're going to shipwreck on these sandbars off the coast of North Africa. And then by God's grace, you know what? They land on this island called Malta. And that's where the next movement of the story starts. Uh, check this out, man. They, they, they're way off course, but about midnight, the sailors start hearing something that you only hear close to the land, which is the waves crash on the rocks. Now, when you're in the middle of a hurricane and you can't see anything, that's the last sound you want to hear, right? And so look what happens in verse 33. Just before dawn, Paul urged all of them to eat. He said, hey, man. The last 14 days, you've been in constant suspense. You've gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. I urge you, take some food. You're going to need this to survive. Now, God's already told them they're going to all survive. But look, this is just common sense leadership. If you don't eat, you won't be strong enough to swim ashore when the ship crashes. I mean, remember what the Lord told me. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. And then he said this. And I'm telling you, he's leading the way, y'all. He took some bread. He gave thanks to God in front of them, and he broke the bread, and he began to eat himself. Now, there are two keys to great spiritual leadership in this passage. Number one, fervent prayer. Number two, good breakfast. Can I hear amen? Right? Now, you know, we laugh about that, but let me tell you something. I've been eating breakfast once a week with a group of godly men from our church and the church I served before this one and the seminary I served before that and the Bible college I served before that. I've been meeting with men one, at least one day a week for the last 40-something years, and I could not possibly describe to you how much strength and wisdom and encouragement has come to me because I eat with godly men every week. You should be doing that. Paul did it. Jesus did it. It'll have a transformative effect on your life. I hope every man, woman, student in our church is in a weekly prayer breakfast, lunch, coffee, home group, group night meeting somewhere on one of our campuses every single week. Friends, if you can't find a group like that at Connecting Point, and they can connect you, man, but if you can't find a group like that, find three friends and start one. It will change your life. Look at verse 36. They were all encouraged, and they ate some food themselves. Together there were 276. Everybody say 276. 276 of us on board. And when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing all the grain into the sea, which was ruined from salt water anyway at this point. But isn't it interesting how similar this is to the story that we read in Matthew 14 when the disciples are caught in a terrible storm on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus miraculously walks out to them on the water, which is a crazy miracle. Can't wait to see the video when I get to heaven, right? And then he calls out to the video. They said, Lord, is that you? And he's like, yeah. 
And then one of the guys says, call to us and we'll come to you. And he says, come on. How many guys got out of the boat? One. His name was Peter. And as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he got to participate in a miraculous expression of the power of God on earth. And the minute he took his eyes off Jesus and started looking at the storm and all the chaos around, dude, he started sinking. And you know, that's what we see right here too. Everybody on that ship whose eyes were on the storm and the danger and panicking and caving, they're, they're, they're gone. But the guy who kept his eyes on the Lord in the midst of all that chaos was at peace and God used him to lead. I'm telling you, man, that connection with Jesus in the hardest moment is what God used to actually elevate Paul to a position of spiritual leadership on a Roman ship in the middle of a crisis. He got on that ship in handcuffs as a captive. And by this point in chapter 27, he's the commander of that ship. Whatever he says, they do, which is awesome. And that brings us to the next uh, movement in this story, and that's the disaster shipwreck that happens in verse 39. You know, Paul's, this leg of Paul's trip to Rome is almost over, y'all. Look at verse 39. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, and they decided, let's run the ship aground if we can. And so they cut loose the anchors and left them in the sea. Friends, in 1971, a group of Maltese divers found four ancient Roman-style anchors in 90 feet of water in approximately the same location where they think this ship was grounded. And we don't know for sure if they're the anchors from that Egyptian grain ship, but I wouldn't be surprised. And if they are, dude, that'd be an amazing confirmation of this story, right? They cut the anchors. At the same time, they untied the ropes that held the rudders. They hoisted the foresail to the wind. They made for the beach, but the ship stuck in a sandbar and ran aground, and the bow stuck fast, and it would not move, and then the stern was just broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. And the soldiers did what the protocol was. They pulled their swords. They're getting ready to kill all the prisoners to prevent them from swimming away and escaping. Now watch how Paul, Paul's life is saved. All right, God saves his life through this centurion. The centurion wanted to spare Paul's life. Why? That dude's a believer now. Listen, everything Paul has said has come true. Everything he said that sounded so wacky to us now has proven to be true. And so now because of his spiritual authority on that ship, man, when he speaks, everybody listens. That's spiritual leadership, y'all. He wanted to save Paul's life and keep them from carrying out their plan. So he ordered those who could swim, jump overboard first, get to land. The rest of us will get there on planks or pieces of the ship. And in this way, everyone, say everyone. Everyone, everyone reached the land and safely, which, which brings us to the miraculous safe deliverance. Now, uh, I just want to read for you what happened in Malta. And then I want to challenge you to be a spiritual leader. In your company, your home, your office, your classroom, your neighborhood. You. I'm not, don't listen to this to somebody else. I'm talking to you. We're going to challenge you to be a spiritual leader. Now look what happened. Uh, it says, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. Isn't it great how God puts in the heart of people all over the world, even lost people, that when there's trouble, we should be kind and, and caring for each other. Only weird religion messes that up. Uh, the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire. They welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Question, <laughs> was this a campfire or a bonfire? <laughs> it's a bonfire. How many people came out of the water wet and cold? 276. And let me tell you, some little campfire where you're singing Kumbaya ain't going to be big enough, right? So, I mean, they're, they're building a fire. But listen, Luke said they all reached the shore safely. Awesome. But what is Paul doing? What is the apostle Paul doing? Look at verse 3. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood. And, and he, let's stop right there for a second. Paul is the spiritual leader. He's the pastor of that ship. Is he sitting back on some throne somewhere saying, somebody bring me a cup of coffee? No. Dude, he's serving. Man, he's trying to help. He's throwing his strength into the fight, man. He's gathering fuel for the fire. He's helping out. Listen, this is one of the telltale signs of spiritual leaders. They care. They serve. They do what they ask everybody else to do. They step up. He's not one of these pompous nerds who would walk over a piece of paper on the floor because I asked somebody else's job to clean that up. No. 
Paul led from the front. Dude, you got to love the humility and the servant leadership of this guy, right? So he gathered up a pile of brushwood. As he put it on the fire, a viper, a poisonous snake, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. And when the islanders saw this snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, man, this guy must be a murderer, for though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now, do you notice that justice is capitalized here? This is the name of a mythological goddess in the Greek pantheon. This is allegedly Zeus's daughter, Justice. The Maltese believe what most people believe. They believe that if you're good, good things will happen to you, and if you're bad, bad things will happen to you, right? And so when Paul escapes the shipwreck and he gets bit by the poisonous snake, they think, oh, he's got some hidden sin in his life. This is karma, man. He's going to die from a snake bite. Superstition. Look at verse 5. Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. And the people were like, what? They expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. And after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and said, oh, he's a god. <laughs> Those pagan religions are pretty fickle, aren't they? I mean, you're a murderer one minute and a god the next. You know what that means? They don't know what to make of this. They don't know how to explain this, but followers of Jesus do. Because all through the New Testament, we read about the 12 apostles doing miraculous things which caused people's minds to open up to believe in Jesus. And I mean, that's the pattern. The apostles, everybody say apostles. apostles. The apostles worked miracles to substantiate the message about Jesus. They would do these unexplainable things and people would go, who sent you here? Who are we talking about now? Listen, Jesus predicted this in Mark 16, 18, that the apostles, everybody say apostles. apostles. Not everybody in the church. Not everybody who wants to. Not everybody who feels led to pick up a snake or do whatever. The apostles are doing specific miraculous works for a specific purpose. They're going to work miracles. They're going to take up snakes in their hands. They will not be hurt. They will put their hands on the sick, and they will get well. And the apostles did all that stuff. It happens right here in this story. Look at verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home for three days and entertained us hospitably. Wouldn't you like to see that house? You invite 276 people over for the weekend. <laughs> And we're going to have a big old feast. It's going to be awesome, man. I'd love to see that house. His father was sick, though. His daddy was sick and suffering from fever and dysentery. You know what dysentery is, right? Dysentery is the number, one, the number two killer of children in the world. It's a diuretic disease. Kills, it's the number two killer of children in the world right behind abortion. Dysentery killed 1,100,000 people last year worldwide. Abortion killed a million and a half people in America last year. It's a horrible killer. It's a dangerous thing. Second worst killer in the world. So his daddy had dysentery, and then Paul went in to see him. Don't you love the apostle Paul? <laughs> Your daddy's sick? Can I pray for him? And the guy's like, would you? And, and after prayer, Paul placed his hands on him and healed him. And when this had happened, the rest of the sick of the island came and were cured. Now, the word healed and the word cured are two different words. You know, healed is miraculous. Cured may be what Luke, the doctor, was able to do for some of those folks. So you got Paul and Luke helping all the sick people in Malta, you know, doing miracles if it needs a miracle, treatment if it needs a treatment. And because these guys just cared for the needs of the people in Malta, they honored us in so many ways. The man, when we were ready to sail, they blessed us, man. They furnished us with all the supplies we needed. Next stop, Italy. Now, let me just stop right here. And in the minutes we have left, I want to use what we've learned today to encourage you to aspire to be a spiritual leader. What have we learned here today? Number one, spiritual leaders lead the way. They lead the way. They don't have to be extroverts, but they lead the way. Now, just so you know I'm serious, here's a picture of me taking out the serpent at the journey work day. You see this right here? Man, we pull the board back. There was a snake. People started freaking out. I'm like, well, since he's not poisonous, I'll pick him up. And so, <laughs> and let me just say, he was not poisonous. I did not get bit, and I didn't have to throw him in the fire because that's a working snake. That snake works for us. He's killing rats at the journey. Somebody say praise the Lord, all right? He's doing his job. We're glad about that, all right? But now listen, don't you love the fact that Paul leads the way, listen to me now, by talking about what he's doing and doing what he's talking about? That's Paul. He talks about what he's doing 
and he does what he's talking about. When he talks about prayer, he doesn't just say, I'll pray for you. He leads the way. He prays. He prays, and God answers his prayers in this story. When he talks about trusting the Lord, he's not just saying, oh, we need to trust the Lord, and then panic like everybody else. Dude, he keeps his attitude positive. His eyes on Jesus. His peace is strong because his eyes are on the Lord. He doesn't give up hope or despair like everybody else. He leads the way, man. God will work through this. When he talks about compassion and caring for the hurting, he leads the way. Man, he helps build a fire. He heals Publius' dad. He and Luke care for sick people all over Malta. That's what our church does with foster kids and adoptive kids and hungry kids on five continents every stinking day. Listen, spiritual leaders talk about what they're doing, but then they do what they're talking about. And not just when the sun's shining. Paul didn't want to be on the island of Malta. He didn't want to be involved in a shipwreck. He didn't want to spend two weeks in a hurricane, sick, seasick, throwing his guts up every day. But that's where he found himself, and that's where he was a spiritual leader, and that's where he led the way. You know, Corrie ten Boom is a Holocaust survivor, and she was from the Netherlands, sweet little lady. She wrote a classic book called The Hiding Place about her experiences in, uh, with the Nazis during World War II, and, and if you haven't read that book yet, you should. She and her sister Becky uh, were imprisoned by the Nazis at the horrible female slave labor camp called Ravensbrück. And you know what the horrible crime was that they committed? Uh, they, hid, they hid Jewish people in their house who were being hunted by the Nazis. And when the Nazis found that out, they arrested them and took those two women to Ravensbrück. 130,000 women went into that camp as prisoners. Very few walked out. Corey walked out. Her sister Betsy died there. By God's grace, Corey and Bessie were assigned to the same barracks. And somehow, these two little Dutch Christian women smuggled a little tiny New Testament into that barracks. And they said, we need to start a Bible study. In a Nazi slave labor camp barracks. They didn't want to be there, but they did want to lead the way. And so they started a Bible study. They were reading in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 where Paul says, you should give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Did I mention the barracks was infested with fleas? Absolutely miserable. But Betsy said, Corey, we need to lead the way. We need to give God thanks for being in this place. And Corey said, I am not thanking God for this fleet-infested hellhole. And Betsy said, yes, you are. We're going to lead the way. We're going to obey the Lord. We're going to thank him that we're in this barracks instead of sleeping out in the snow somewhere. We're going to thank him that we're together instead of separated. We're going to thank him that we got this Bible with us so we can have a Bible study. We're going to thank the Lord just out of sheer obedience. And they led the way. And they started their Bible study in that flea-infested barracks. And as time went by, they noticed that their barracks was the only barracks where there was an uninterrupted Bible study. The Nazi soldiers never broke in and interrupted the Bible study and stole their Bible like they did all the other barracks. Consequently, many, 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 many Jewish women put their faith in Jesus because of the Bible study in that that barracks. And then they noticed that none of the women in their barracks were being sexually assaulted by the guards. Everybody in that camp was being raped except the women in their barracks. And then they found out after the war, it was because of the fleas, that God used fleas to protect them from those uh, you know, violent Nazi guards. And God used fleas to help them start a Bible study to protect many, many, many of those Jewish women from hell. And God did that because they led the way. Now, friends, We may not always find ourselves where we want to be. The weather might not always be the weather we want. But wherever we are, God is with us and he will use us for his purposes if we are willing to lead the way. Amen? Amen. I hope you'll also notice that spiritual leaders are loved. They are loved. If you feel like nobody loves me, you should start being a spiritual leader. Because let me tell you, the spiritual leaders in this story are loved. You know, when Paul walked on board that ship in handcuffs, he knew two people. He knew Luke and Aristarchus, and that was it. Dude, when they crawl out of the water in Malta, (laughs) the the centurion Julius, the passengers, the owners, the captain, the other soldiers, Publius' dad, and many of the people in Malta owed Paul their lives and loved him because of his spiritual leadership. I mean, it says so right here at the end of the chapter, when they left Malta, man, people brought gifts and supplies and blessings for them because they loved him. If you show spiritual leadership, 
The right people will love you. If you don't feel love right now, maybe you ought to show some spiritual leadership. You know, last year was the 20th anniversary of the attack on the World Trade Center. Really solemn time for all of us. I can remember exactly where I was when that attack took place. And I bet many of you can too. What you may not remember is the first officially recorded fatality of that attack. This is a picture of the New York fireman uh, carrying the body of Father Michael Judge out to be buried. Father Michael was a Franciscan priest. He was a chaplain of the New York City Fire Department. They gave him full firefighter's gear. Every time the siren went off, he showed up. He showed up to comfort, to encourage, to support, to pray for the firemen, pray for the victims. He was there. When the sirens went off at 9-11, he put on his gear. He went to the towers. He saw the devastation, the fire, the threat. And like so many other heroic servant leaders, like the firefighters we have in our church right here, you know, when everybody else is running away, he ran toward the last place anybody would want to be. And today, Father Michael is considered a hero in the New York City Fire Department, deeply loved by the men that he served, the men who served with him. When he died, they found a, a prayer in his wallet that he had written sometime earlier. It's called Father Michael's Prayer. And this is what he wrote. Lord, take me where you want me to go. Not where I want to go. Lord, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me, Lord, what you want me to say and keep me out of your way. You know, we don't always get to choose what boat we're on, <laughs> what storm we're in, what shipwreck we face, or what island we find ourselves marooned on. But we do get to choose if we'll be a spiritual leader there. We get to choose that. And when we do, we'll lead the way. And the right people will love us for it. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you that you love us when we lead spiritually. Jesus, thank you for setting us an example of spiritual leadership that when we follow, we know you love that. Lord, you, you love seeing your sons and daughters do what you would do and be like you would be in any situation. And so I pray, God, that there will be high school and middle school students here today, Lord, who will be spiritual leaders at school tomorrow. I pray, God, that there are soldiers and police officers and firemen, Lord, who are here today who will be spiritual leaders at work tomorrow. I pray, God, that in every community, in every school, in every business, people will feel the presence of spiritual leaders tomorrow who do, Lord, what you want them to do. And bless who you want them to bless and serve who you want them to serve. And we pray, God, that that'll be us. That'll be us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching Compassion Online. We'd love to invite you to join us for our live services with worship, prayer partners, and more. For exclusive online content, head to live.compassionchristian.com to join our community. And if you liked this sermon, well, you should check out the rest of the messages from this series in the playlist to the left. Also, click over here if you want to subscribe to see more videos like this one. We'd love to connect with you. Just head to CompassionChristian.com connect and I'll reach out to you soon.